Today's webinar is uh, pertaining to all the steps that we need to take for the 2023 match. And there's a lot of changes that have occurred over the past 12 months. I cannot believe that it's uh, already the 2023 match season. This is going to be AC Medical's 21st year participating in the match. And so we come to you with a lot of experience and with over 1,400 of our members that we've been able to track that have matched. And so we certainly hope that you're going to be one of them next. As always, we'd like to start with the registration survey questions and uh, what some of your responses were. Those are always delightful to uh, read and, and share with you, Dr. Rosas. Of course. So we asked you what your opinion is on the criteria that residency programs will be looking at now that there has been changes on the USMLE step one, now that it's pass or fail. We asked you what you think residency programs will now consider. A couple of you said still step one scores. You know, step one score, we have seen it in the program director survey, just in the, in, in the matter between 2020 and 2021 program director survey, we see that the importance of it has significantly dropped. It's, you know, it's gone from 4.1, 4.2 down to in the mid to low threes out of a, a total of five score. And so the significance of it is dropping. The popularity of it in, you know, is still there in some of the specialties like internal medicine and, and some of the more competitive specialties, but Definitely the, uh, the importance and the, the, the stickiness of step one is weaning. So if you've taken the step one previously and you have a, the score, will it still appear on your application? It does. Unfortunately, it does. And, you know, there's a lot of talk within GME community to blind the selection committees to the scores or all the scores altogether. But again, in reality, I'm not sure how well that's going to work. But technically speaking, if a program has standardized factors that they look at when they want to give somebody an interview, they would eliminate, they would remove step one score as a factor, as a deciding factor. And by virtue of removing it and by separating out who's giving the interviews and who is interviewing, that should normalize somewhat the appearance of score on, on transcript. Uh, a couple of them also said uh, step two scores, they'll consider that instead of yeah. step and, and so we are going to talk, we have a really good uh, a tip section of, of our uh, presentation on step two and passing step three. So we're going to talk about that. And then also grades in school? Sure. Grades from school. And the way that this would come is, is you know, if your MSP is impressive, then of course, then the, 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 the admission committee is going to look at your MSP and, and take your medical education into consideration. If they can't make heads or tails out of your, your, your transcript or, you know, if it's you know, if there's no order to it, I've seen transcripts that, you know, 70, 80 subjects were just put back to back to back with no delineation of which year in medical school those subjects were taken. And those are very, very hard to follow. If you can take that and you can make a really nice MSP out of it and get the cooperation of your school, then of course, grades are going to matter. And of course, grades in your required clerkships and in the, in the specialty of that you're applying to all of those matters, those, those importances are going higher. And then also where you graduated, the school that you graduated from? Sure, that could that could make a difference, but this is more about U.S. medical schools and graduating from those than than foreign medical schools. So it's very hard to establish the quality of a foreign medical school and compare it directly to that of a U.S. medical school. And then year of graduation. Sure, this this you know this is something that bothers a lot of us. You know, when was the last time that we graduated from the medical school? And the reason why I said last time is because there are certain people that have that have attended medical school several times. A year of graduation is important, but it's more important what you've done since graduation. So if it's been 20 years and you've not done anything, well, I mean, when I say not done anything, you may have done other things that are not patient care related, then of course that is a problem. If you graduated 20 years ago and 17 of those 20 years you've been practicing medicine, then of course that's a good thing, but then we got other things to worry about, which is, you know, are you still teachable and, you know, how, how absorbent are you of, of, of information that we're about to give you. So that's where that year of graduation is going to come in. And also the older your year of graduation, the, the older your application is going to feel, right? It's going to feel aged. And so we've got to make sure that, that we address that. Uh, so getting a you know, trained eye on how to prepare your US application, especially if your year of graduation is as much older as, as critical. And so definitely having US clinical experience and having strong letters of recommendation from those clinical experience and will it be better to have a, a LOR that has close ties to the residency uh, to a program and their top tier recommendation? 
Yeah, great question. And, you know, yesterday I was in an office hour and, and, and one of the participants was, you know, he, he didn't know whether the, the program directors were asking for U.S. clinical experience just to kind of get him off of their, you know, their back or they really meant it and they really mean it, you know, to start residency. I mean, forget about what the residency program requirements are and, and you competing against U.S. medical seniors who have you know, were in their senior elective rotations as they're competing with you and applying to these residencies. But if I'm assumed to be resident, I would feel uncomfortable. I mean, highly uncomfortable to the point of not wanting to do it. If I have had not had recent clinical experiences here where I'm going to be expected to perform. And so EOS clinical experience is critical. Letters of recommendation, of course, is critical. I'm less worried about the tie between the letter writer and the program or a top tier recommendation. I'm more concerned about the the command of the, the writer's command on English language, the, the content of the letter, and how personalized it is. And those are those are much more important to me than a letterhead or the proximity of that letter writer to, to GME. But again, those are important, but the content is more important. And then someone said here, MSPE or the Dean's letter? Yeah, critical. So what's critical. the difference? Yeah, so it used to be called Dean's letter, right? And between 2010 and 2015, these residency programs just got sick of reading these letters of recommendation from deans that their job is to see their, their, their seniors get into residency. So they're very, very biased in their opinion. And so they changed the name from dean's letter to medical student performance evaluation, but some of the deans were pretty slow to adapt. And then they just completely did away with, with any opinion of the dean in the 2016 recommended guidelines. And they said, look, the, the, the opinion of the dean doesn't matter. We just want to know facts. We want to see, you know, comparative data between uh, this student performed versus the rest of their cohort. And that's what we want to see. And unfortunately, many medical students that are attending medical school abroad or graduates from medical schools abroad are being told MSPE does not matter. There is no statement farther from the truth than that. MSP is critical. If it is written poorly, it's just like submitting a poor letter of recommendation. It's just like you know, applying to residency with a failed USMLE and not having that pass it. So pay attention to your MSPE, pay attention to your personal statement, pay attention to every component of your, your ERS application in order to keep increasing your chances of being noticed. Which brings me to the next point, commitment to specialty and research and publications. Commitment to specialty. The name of the game is to maintain the interest of the application reviewer of the selection committee of the person who is going to say yes or no to you receiving an interview to maintain their attention if you lose their attention you're it's you're done if you maintain their attention and it goes in 30 second increments it, every 30 seconds you got to see well have I, I'm, I'm, are you still there are you still there are you still there and that's what your application has to do so you have to show commitment to specialty and i really invite you to take uh, you know and listen to or watch our episode 60 and 61, which is going to be the week after of our lifetime member of AC Medical. And he matched into pediatrics and he will tell you what this particular factor did for him and how it came up in almost every one of the interviews. So really, really critical. As far as research and publication, we have a, a good slide on this and we'll cover those uh, at that point. And we also ask what you're, what you're all planning to do for the meantime while preparing for the match. One of you said application preparation, of course. Yeah, yeah of course, yes. Mm -hmm. And then gaining U.S. clinical experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're gonna have uh, we have, we're gonna have a few slides on that. And then working in a clinical setting. Yeah, be careful with this, and especially if you are on a B one, B two visa or a you know non employment type of visa. Uh, and if you're a U.S. citizen or resident, whatever you do in a clinical setting, if you're planning on working, make sure that it. It, it aligns itself well with the specialty that you're applying to. Don't do radiology or be a ra radiology tech if you're applying to family medicine. You know, don't go into a nephrology clinic if you're planning on applying to pediatrics. Don't just take, you know, just an opportunity to have patient contact just to fill time. I would rather probably you not do it than, than, to, than to be in a different specialty than the one you're applying to. So working as a pathologist assistant, if you're applying to pathology, would that be a good idea? Uh, yes, it would be if the, if they're a PA pathology assistant, uh, if they're in the United States and they're doing it in person. And if it's a, if it's an actual 
paying position, yes. And some of you mentioned completing your USMLE, such as your step two, CK and step three. Yeah, I'm not a fan of step three at all for those that have passed their USMLEs on the first attempt. If you've not passed your step one or two CK on your first attempt, then we've got to talk about studying for step three, but not to necessarily take it. It is a huge turnoff when we see somebody has passed step three after multiple, multiple attempts. And you know, that just says a lot about potentially what this individual, what are some of the hurdles that we're going to have in residency with them. And then, of course, we do have a slide for it, but uh, re research and publication. Yes, and, and we'll, we'll maintain that we keep that a surprise for you all. And then we asked you, what are some of your tips for your other medical graduates who are looking for U.S. clinical experiences? And someone said, well-established with good history review from past rotating students, if available, liability coverage assistance and information, and connections with programs such as academic, research, medical prep. Uh, of course, and, and those are really good things to have if, if you can find them. At AC Medical, we have uh, you'll, you'll know it and, and our members will tell you we're, we're really sticklers with regards to getting reviews back from our members and, and we, we, we expose all of that on our website as well. And so, so look for reviews. They're all real. They're all very, very blunt. And, and I think that they say a lot about each one of the clinical sites. And liability coverage, they're talking about insurance liability coverage, really critical because, you know, if, if there is a lawsuit, you want to be protected. And, and you know, all of the well-respected uh, clinical sites, they won't have anybody there, uh, any visitor without professional liability insurance, just like they wouldn't have a medical student uh, do a clinical rotation without um, professional liability insurance. And the connection with programs, of course, you know, those are auditions and postgraduate sub-internships or sub-internships in gen general. Again, pretty hard to come by. We do have, we do have some uh, clinical sites that are like that. Uh, but if you do find it, absolutely take advantage of it. And then someone said, do proper research or you could Google it. Sure. Yes, of course. Be, be careful with that, right? Um, know your source and, and okay. um, you all know what to expect online. And then someone said, combined inpatient and outpatient rotations, seek hospitals, not private clinics. Uh, you know, I agree and I disagree with this. You know, at, at Morehouse, where, where I, I completed my family medicine residency, we were looking for more outpatient experience and inpatient experience. But within the medical graduate community, they, you know, most of the medical graduates, especially those from abroad, are looking for inpatient experience. And I think the reason for that is they believe that that's where, you know, they could get the more critical cases. And so they could you know, kind of shine a little bit better and or there's more decision makers in the hospital. Well, in the United States, residency is very, very decentralized and you could we even have residencies that are almost 100% outpatient. And so it's much more important getting a type of clinical experience that you establish your ACGME core competencies in. And also private clinics, don't underestimate those. Private clinics, you're going to be expected to see, you know, a patient every 15 to 20 minutes. Whereas an inpatient rotation, maybe you'll have one patient and maybe two patients and you'll have you know, eight to 10 hours to figure things out. In, in outpatient clinics in the US, that's, uh, you, know, you have 15 minutes to figure it out, probably less than that. So to be able to exercise and show that, that you're able to move at that rapid of a pace is critical. Uh, I just got off a phone call. One of the reasons why I was a little bit late right now was I, I received a phone call from an attending physician who was, was telling me that one of our rotators, although they're incredibly nice, they're just having a pretty tough time keeping up with, with the speed of the outpatient clinic. And, and so we had to kind of walk them through that and, and strategize the plan and how to, how to help them move forward with this. So uh, don't, don't underestimate outpatient if it's done well. And then look for opportunities where you are in front of decision makers. Yes, for sure. And then look for places where they get hands-on experiences within residency programs. I don't like to use the word hands-on. I know that we all use the word hands-on loosely, and I do understand what it means amongst us. Hands-on, what, what people refer to is just, you know, taking histories and assisting with exams. And my job as a mentor is to make sure that I also think of much, you know, many, many steps ahead and, and where could things go wrong. And when a state medical board sees the word hands-on, uh, when let's say that you match and you have to apply for licensure and then you you know, they find it in your ERAS application, you said hands-on, they're going to start investigating how could you possibly do hands-on, which is the practice of medicine when you don't have a license or you have done residency 
and something very, very good could turn ugly in a heartbeat. So, um, you know, you don't need to put your application in danger by calling it hands-on, you know, describing the clinical experience. And as long as it is very resonance relevant and, 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 and it involves all these six ACGM core competencies is, is plenty and it's, and it's way more than sufficient. Now, there are tips some um, uh, you offer. Seek medical experience related to the specialty. Yes, and, and these, by the way, again, these are tips from our, our, our audience and the registrants. And, and you know, we're going to go into a lot more detail. Yes, this is really important because you got to show commitment to the specialty. We've got some really good slides on that. And making sure that they get a strong LOR from that experience. Yeah, and, and, and we got to be able to define what strong means. Strong is, is something that is personalized and I can connect with it. I can, I, I probably, when I read letters of recommendation or analysis session, I have a pretty tough time connecting with these letters because most of them are just generic. The, the letter writer is not qualified. Maybe they're a foreign letter writer. And, you know, just, you know, positive statements does not make a letter strong. Great examples, usage of ACGME core competencies, you know, a well-balanced letter that doesn't just talk about all the positive, but talks about some of the, you know, the areas where you improved upon. And a good writer, right? Good writing skills and, and, and somebody who can actually connect and, and speak very efficiently. And also the qualification of the letter writer is critical. A program director or an associate program director must write very differently than a community attending physician. And so we look for those patterns in letters and, and that's what makes it strong, weak or, or dangerous or, or very beneficial. And then contact doctors in the area. Uh, sure, you could do that, but again, be very careful in what you do in these uh, in these clinics. Uh, don't get caught up in working uh, in these clinics for free. Don't get caught up in in physicians, um, you know, promising you a letter of recommendation if you stay there for six months, twelve months. That's not the way you should be spending your time. You should, you know, you should be insured. There should be a contract between the the, the preceptor and what is expected of them, and and either yourself or or like we do with with AC Medical. And also, you uh, you got to after four weeks, you got to bounce. You got to go to the next clinical site. Got to go to the next clinical site. Go to the next because you need letters of recommendation, and and you need to make your application look like a U.S. medical senior. And so, you can contact doctors in your area, but again, uh, just keep all of those other things in mind. Then uh, also contacting, emailing doctors and agencies. Yes, and got to go hand in hand. We go through paid services like a married clerkship. The thing with, with us, though, is, is we know that, that it's not just your clinicals that matters. Clinicals are just a means to an end. And for us, the end is you being ranked, you're securing interviews, and you being ranked and you matching. And so clinicals is just a part of that equation. But yes, of course, if you can identify an agency that, that can give you the whole package, not just clinicals, and then kind of you know farm you out to other places or other consultants to take care of your personal statement and and maybe just send you to videos to, to put your ERS application together. Uh, that's, that's quite different. We, we really like to look at ourselves as as complete residency entry solution and, and also residency survival. And so please keep those things in mind. Thank you, Dr. Rosas. And thank you for, for all the, uh, the registrants who shared their information. So here are some of your questions and our 11 uh, tips, not out, are. So, you know, how to avoid a burnout, how to prevent burnout through uh, between clinical rotations, application preparation, and interview preparation, and, and all of that. And, you know, first, you know, tip number one, first, you got to care for yourself before you care for others. And, uh, you know, you got to believe in yourself. And, you know, one of the things that I like to do is, uh, you know, you just got to find even 20, 30 minutes to just exercise daily that gets your mind off of things. Uh, if you feel sad, if you feel that, you know, there's any signs of depression, you know it. Uh, it's very, very common. You know, don't be embarrassed about it. Get treatment. And one of the things that you could do is you could lower your anxiety and stress by, by finding a reliable mentor with similar backgrounds as you who was able to connect with you and, and kind of walk you through the entire process. I can't, I can't stress how much that lowers fatigue, uh, your own stress, uh, and, uh, and, and increases certainty, which all of those improve your confidence, right? So that you don't have any blind spots. Now, some of you have red flags that can or, you know, or they should be addressed. And, and some of you, you cannot. And so just accept it and move on. But, you know, if the red flag, if we identify it as important that, that it needs to be addressed, then, then let's work on it to, to address it. And again, that really helps with your mental health and, and, and how you deal with things. Don't apply to residency by taking food off the table. 
And I can't, I can't tell you how many times uh, people just spend their 401k and their life savings to apply to four or 500 programs. And, and we look at their application and I wouldn't even invest one program in, in the application that they put together. So get proper advice because, you know, this is, the situation is in a way where you haven't matched and, you know, things are just looking more grim and grim every year. You got to stop, hit reset and, and get help just so that you, you stop this cycle. And if you have a significant other, have an honest conversation with them to, 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 to figure out how you're going to be supported throughout this process, financially, mentally, all, all, you know, all, all sorts. And for all of our AC medical members, you know, we, we want to make sure that you come and you discuss anything that is on your mind with your mentor, with me, with our leadership interns, like the Rosas, all the other interns that are working at AC medical. And we want you to attend and collaborate with other AC medical members to see how they are handling their own stresses and you know, how we help them figure out new ways of dealing with it to make sure that you take advantage of those. Other questions and concerns were you know, interview preparation. How can we impress the program directors and faculty during an interview? You know, the best way to do that is to turn the entire process on, on its head and get to know every piece of the process as if you're preparing for USMLE questions. And what do I mean by that? Know the timelines, not just NRMP and ECFMG and ERAS, but dig deeper. Supplemental offer and acceptance program. Know when it starts, know how it's set up and how that could impact you if you do not match. If you're an AC medical member, know our timelines and for credentialing both internal and external and how that plays a role in your clinical starts and, and where we help you with your residency application and personal statement and your letters and, and all, all, all the other aspects of your application package and also your school. Many schools in the Caribbean will not allow you to start your clinical rotations unless you have step one passed. And some don't even let you graduate if you don't have your step two CK passed. So know those timelines, know those requirements, because they could all impact your ability to, you know, waste an entire year just by because of missing a few days and not paying attention to those deadlines. And next thing is you got to know your mentor and you got to ask yourself and, and don't be afraid of asking why should you follow their advice? And, you know, just like you qualify your letter writers, for example, what is a qualified letter writer? It's got to be somebody who's, who's done residency in the United States, who's licensed here, who's done what they're recommending you for and, uh, you know, who writes well and they have personal experience with you in an environment that is going to be relevant to residency. And that's a qualified letter writer. And so your mentor must have personal experience with what they're recommending you to as well. So they got to be a part of the entire process. So for example, they should be a selection committee member. They should be, um, you know, either a former PD or current PD or graduate medical education faculty, and preferably an MD or a doctor of osteopathy preferred. But, you know, we've had some really good mentors that are not MDs or DOs, but Again, it's important for them to be a part of the process. You need to understand how experts, this is at NRMP, at ERAS, ECFMG, all physicians that you work with, and some even some enthusiasts, right, that have not done residency, but they've done a pretty good job at, at putting together some, you know, to, to express their view of the match and, and how they dissect the match. There's some really excellent content uh, providers on, on YouTube and, and online. And you know, NRMP provides some really good residency data and reports. I refer to it every single day. So three reports that I think that are really important is the 2022 uh, main residency match results. Take a look at that. For example, how does that come into play? For example, if you're thinking about OBGYN, out of the 1,500 plus matches, just a little over 80 of them were international medical graduates. So if you're up for that type of challenge, then by all means, let's do it. But if you rethink and you say, look, my funds are limited. I've done this for five years. I've been going after OBGYN for five years. This is just not working out. What do I got to do here? Then understand where there's a higher number of match with candidates that match your demographics. The charting outcomes in the match for IMGs, US medical doctors, US doctors of osteopathy, very important, three different reports. And where you could look at this, one of the most critical pieces is I know you've all seen these charts, right? You've seen it and, you, you know, you, but, but I challenge you to do this. Go ahead and open this up again. Open up internal medicine, go to internal medicine and take a look at the chart that talks about match rate and number of different specialties on the rank order list and see how the match rate and interview rate drops the more specialties that are on, on someone's rank order list. 
which if you take that and then you look at it from that dimension, you know, it answers a question, should I apply to more than one specialty or, or stick with one? And, you know, which we'll talk about that a little bit more. And the results of the 2021 program director survey, this is probably by far the most important document that you all should look at. And if, you know, for AC medical members, come to our office hours so that we can go in and discuss this. You know, there's some really great content on youtube.com forward slash AC medical org. And of course, our future docs podcast, where every week we're putting out content and we try to keep it as, as creative and as relevant to you all as possible. A lot of work. And again, uh, goes into that. And again, Dr. Rosas, thank you so much for that. You need to know who your true competition is and just ask yourself right now, who am I competing against? And, you know, I, I really hope that there are some U.S. medical seniors here in our webinar today, but, you know, probably not, you know, as, as many as I would like for them to be. But U.S. medical seniors are your number one competition, not other international medical graduates or you know, yourself, et cetera. The, the, your true competition is them. So understanding how they put their application together will help you you know, level up, step up to that and, 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 and have higher expectations of yourself. Know your red flags and, and deal with them head on. We have a really good uh, slide on this. And then know how different specialties interview and know how online interview is gonna be different than an in-person interview. And also know the factors that yield interviews versus those that get you ranked. And also go into the matches if you're not going to match and so familiarize yourself with supplemental offer and acceptance program. And those that did that with us this past match cycle, 2022, we probably, it was probably our most successful soap cycle. You know, some of the stories that we heard, uh, including those from, you know, our Ukrainian doctor, you know, who joined us right before soap and we helped her and she finally matched during soap. I mean, these, these success stories are just mind blowing. And so don't underestimate soap. So again, how do you really prepare is by looking at every aspect of your application. And with regards to all of you that are here, whether you're members or not, here's, there's some free resources for you available on an acmedical.org forward slash academy. You know, that's, that's all free and consider residency prep or residency entry. And for those of you that think that, look, I probably need a little bit more assistance with interview prep. We have membership for that too. And that's, you know, for full 2023 support. And if you're not a member, we do even offer fee waivers go ahead and ask your enrollment consultant, how do we get the membership fees waived? And, and of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel just to make sure that you stay uh, informed with us. And for all of the residency entry members, I wanna make sure that you all attend our weekly supplemental ERAS application and ERAS analysis and editing office hours as soon as additional resources are available, which is gonna be sometime between April and June. Tip number three. Residencies are adopting uh, supplemental ERAS application in masses, and so should you. And last year was the first year that supplemental ERAS came to play. You know, was, we had to learn about it, you know, within, it felt like just within a week or two weeks. And this year, there's a lot more preparation. We are going to have, uh, you know, webinars, Dr. Rose has mentioned, on May 4th. So please make sure that you register for this. But, you know, it's an addition to your ERAS application. And it includes information about your geographic preferences. It's by region, by urban, rural settings. Uh, it's information about the most meaningful experiences in your life and other events that have impacted your life, if, if there is any. And, and whether you want to signal programs. And for our residency entry members, we have supplemental ERAS application analysis and editing added to membership benefits this year. And so you complete it and then you come to office hours and then you know, will help you edit your supplemental ERAS. So that's a, a new benefit and, and quite a, an important one. Now, you're going to say, well, you know, this is only, you know, it was this only uh, last year with general surgery, internal medicine, and dermatology. I mean, I don't need to worry about this. Well, look at what's happening this year in 2023. Look at all the residencies that are requiring at least one of the three portions of your supplemental ERAS. And this number is just you know, skyrocketed, adult neuro, anesthesiology, derm, diagnostic radiology, interventional radiology, ER, general surgery, internal medicine, categorical, internal medicine, psych, neurosurgery, OBGYN, orthosurgery, PEDS, PMNR, preventive medicine, psychiatry. They, they are all requiring it now. Now there are like, for example, OBGYN only wants to use the, the program signaling feature of it. And, and that's all they want. Emergency medicine, same way. But if you look at orthosurgery, they want to allow up to 30 uh, program certain signalings, but if you look at preventive medicine, three, psychiatry, three, and, and there is going to be new specialties that are added 
you know, I'm, I'm surprised that family medicine is not added to this yet. But again, family medicine really looks at applications a lot more holistically than, than most other specialties. So maybe that's why, but, but, you know, we'll see. So here's your timeline for the 2023 ERAS for your supplemental ERAS. Resources are going to become available from now until June, you know, until when your ERAS token is going to be available. May 19th is uh, when you should attend the, the webinar for supplemental ERAS. July, you're going to get the list of all the programs that are participating in this. And August 1st is when you can start submitting your ERAS application. But the, the first window is, um, you know, there's going to be probably a couple of windows. Maybe they just have one window this year and supplemental ERAS application closes. I wouldn't be surprised if they just have one deadline and say, that's it. And late September, so there's going to be a couple of weeks break between when you submit your supplemental ERAS and when you you certify your, your, your 2023 ERAS application, and then everything is going to be available all at the same time. And, and mind you, your MSP is going to be released at the same time as your ERAS. That's what happened last year. We expect the same thing to happen in 2023 match. Some additional questions you all had for, on how to address red flags, and, and we're going to give you some tips on this. What are common hesitancies program have for taking IMGs and how can we address them? For those with interruption during medical school due to personal health reasons, how to best address it? What is the best way to address poor scores on the interview? Will this 194 on step one haunt me forever? How do I bounce back from a failed attempt? And if possible, I would like to hear some success stories with multiple previous attempts who finally managed to secure residency uh, position. Well, the last one kind of caught my eye. I, I doubt anybody's going to, even if it's a success story, I, don't, I doubt anybody's going to come up and say, look, I've had multiple attempts on the US MLEs and I still got in. Uh, I, I, would be, uh, I would be surprised if, if we find them. But I can tell you from, because I know the demographics of all of our, uh, of our members, we have a, a very, very sizable number of our members with, with multiple attempts on the US MLE that do secure interviews and a match, but everyone does it so differently. Some do it with, uh, with just doing a lot of rotations with auditions and, and, and building connections that way. Some don't like you know, that type of vulnerability where it's just a limited number of programs and they want to put the best application together and, and just you know, fan that application across the country in one specialty. Sometimes we have them apply to two specialties. That's one of the exceptions. We'll talk about that in just a bit more. But suffice it to say that, that there are several people with multiple attempts on um, both the ERAS on, on USMLEs with, with huge gaps that they get in, but they, they got to really follow all of the, the directions that, that we provided here and all the tips and, and really understand who they're competing against. So let's go ahead and address uh, some additional questions. I'm concerned about financially managing to do rotations and apply to many programs. And then how do I gain US clinical experience without breaking the bank? And another related question, uh, what's the most efficient use of time if we have six months, one year, or more than one year before applying, and then how to find good mentors? So our tip number four is eliminate application blind spots. Get to know your entire application. And by doing this, you pretty much address every one of those concerns that, that I just read for you. These are just some highlights. And, and of course, there's a lot more detailed questions that you all have asked. I recommend that you not waive your right to see your letters of recommendations. And I know that there's going to be some programs that will disagree with me. I know some, there's some attendings that will disagree with me and that's totally fine. We can have different opinions. Our job at AC medical is to make sure that you don't have any blind spots and that you're not blindsided. And that, you know, if there's something that you don't expect it to do damage, but we do that we bring that to light and then you make a decision whether you want to continue to use this document or not. Greatest example was last week in an office hour where I spoke with one of our members and he spent an entire year with a residency program under the title of a research fellow. And he had clinical experience and he saw patients and he was, you know, taking histories and assisting with physicals, but none of the letters talked about that. It was on purpose that they didn't. And, and so what's the use of, of, a, of a letter of recommendation like that? All they talked about was the research and that certainly is not going to make somebody you know, a strong PGY1 candidate, not saying that he was not, but unfortunately that was the entire 12 months to spend on two letters, which were even poorly written and, and would be problematic. Had he waived his rights to see those, uh, by the way, you know, he did use them and he only got one interview, but had he waived his right and not known it, we would have never known this. And he would have always forever thought that this was one of the most fantastic experiences. And, you know, there's something wrong with the system rather than, than that individual's uh, application. So don't waive your right to see your letters of recommendation. If you, you're, you're a U.S. medical senior, fine. If you have no issues in your medical education, if you haven't been 
you know, on probation, if you if you haven't if you don't go to the dean's office every week, if you haven't gotten in trouble with the school administration, fine, you can waive your your rights to see your letters of recommendation. But everybody else, there's so many, so many, so many factors that go into your letters of recommendation, and that that you should not be waiving your right. And uh, next, you got to get your MSP from your medical school. MSP for some specialties is one of in the top three most important criteria for securing interviews. And so don't ignore this, you know, and you want to make sure that uh, when you are working with a consultant or you're working with a mentor, that you ask them, why are certain recommendations being made? Don't just blindly accept them, ask them, be involved, be closely involved in every single step of the process. Don't just pay for a personal statement to be drafted and then, you know, get the final product and feel really good because, you know, it's got a lot of flowery sentences in it. It's got to sound like you, you got to be able to defend it. It's got to, you know, it's got to be consistent with the rest of your application. So again, don't be afraid of asking why and being involved in the entire process is going to make you stronger. And for all the AC medical members, you know, I, I invite you to attend our daily document analysis office hours. Now with the exception of Fridays, we have this now where Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays, you know, I'm doing office hours uh, for document analysis. And then we have two general office hours uh, a week. So make sure that you attend these and, and we can go over your documents. And by doing a lot of this, your application begins to you know, take shape and, and it becomes more and more worth it for you to invest in, 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 a, in that type of application. Tip number five, the more red flags you have, the wider and stronger your net should be. Again, there were a lot of questions with regards to, hey, how do I go through this process if I've had some, some setbacks? With the pass fail of step one and with the cancellation of step two CS, there's a lot more push to programs to start looking at applications holistically. Now you may not feel it because that's not what people that are around you are talking about, but every data that we see sequentially year after year published in, in PubMed, in NRMP, we're seeing that there is a bigger and bigger and bigger push towards holistic review of the application. So much so that this past match cycle, ERAS introduced supplemental ERAS, which was a pilot project. And look how many specialties have taken on this application. We believe that you know, this supplemental ERAS is so well put together that it could be all that applicant uh, programs look at to decide whether they want to give somebody an interview. It's pretty powerful. And you know, the questions that it asks are very specific. And the way you respond to those questions, you have to be very, very specific and, and it gives a very personalized feel to it. So all of this is lending itself to a more holistic review of the application and the stigma of a program using just USMLE scores as deciding whether somebody's going to be a, a good resident or not is, is getting, beginning to be you know, bigger and bigger. So I'm pretty hopeful about the future. And if you have red flags, don't hide from them. You have to address it, but you cannot shoot yourself in the foot. You know, for example, if you've attended three medical schools, if you've attended three medical schools and it's taken you 18, 20 years to graduate, don't try to hide any of the three medical schools in, in different parts of the ERAS application rather than putting it under medical education. You've got to talk about it. There's nothing more insulting uh, and potentially with legal liabilities than misrepresenting what happened in your history and doing it purposefully. So let's figure out what your red flags are and whether they're really red flags or not. And I can bet you that there's almost for almost every red flag, there is a way to deal with it, but it really has to do with what you're doing to address it. And so the next three, four months are going to be critical. You know, April, May, June, July, August are going to be critical in how you turn those red flags around. You know, and that's why for all of our residency entry members, your residency strategy session that's included in your membership. And so make sure you schedule your residency strategy session sooner than later to let's identify your red flags and let's figure out how we're going to go ahead and address them and, uh, and, and, and prepare your application accordingly. And also in interviews, how do we deal with those? So some of you may think, okay, you know what? I got so many red flags. I'm going to go ahead and take step three, rethink it. Step three does not get you interviews. Step three may impact may very very slight may may impact where a program puts you on their rank order list but almost almost certainly step three is not going to get you interviews you know of course there's always going to be exceptions to every you know every point but for the majority of us greater majority of us step three does not get us interviews 
plus step three is not a required exam. Step three is only something that you all should think about if you've had additional attempts on, on step one or two CK. And the reason for that is programs must demonstrate to ACGME that their residents are able to be licensed. They're, they're licensable. And step three passing is, is it. Almost every program requires that step three be passed before the end of PGY-1. Some may allow you to extend that under extenuating circumstances to PGY-2, but you know it's a test of internship. It's a test of residency. Don't think about that right now. That is not what's going to improve your chances. Research. I just gave you an example of someone who spent a year with a residency program and really built up their research department, but in return, they deflated their own application because they've had there's no documentation of their patient contact whatsoever. And research, if you look at the program director survey, depending on specialty, again, it is something that doesn't necessarily get you interviews, but amongst two very competitive candidates, maybe it makes a little bit of difference in saying, okay, well, this person should come in versus the other. But if you haven't had you know, four or five months of US clinical experience recently, and your letters are not strong already, and your ERAS application is not you know, free of errors, and uh, your supplemental ERAS was submitted on time and your ERAS was submitted on time, if all of those things haven't happened, you doing research or you taking step three, you're not solving anything. You're just covering up those red flags. Those and by themselves are red flags as well. A very good question that was asked is, how do I budget for all of this? How do I make this thing work? Don't just blindly budget for you know $10,000 to apply to ERAS. That's a mistake. And I also think that it is a mistake to apply to programs based on their requirements. Almost everyone that is here is looking for, you know, a program giving them a chance. And almost everybody here has a red flag in their application. And so these programs are not going to say, we're okay with this list of red flags. You'll never find that. What you're looking for is for a program to say, you know what, in this situation, these are the things that I like about this application. I'm willing to look at it a little bit more holistically than to just stick with my own criteria. It's just like any other business hiring employees. You know, all the good employees do not fit this, you know, box of, of criteria. And so programs know this. They're very, you know, re they're, they're, they're very experienced in, and they're becoming a lot better at identifying good residents. And so if you put the best application together, even though you know you have your red flags, what you're doing is you're saying, look, here's my red flag. These are my challenges, but I rose to the occasion. And these are all the things that I've done to improve my application and my candidacy to you. And I'm going to keep doing that. And that's what we want to see. As a matter of fact, how you deal with challenges in, in life is one of the, the, the factors that program directors are using. It's in the NRMP program director survey and how that impacts who do they give an interview to. That that, that, and then how we bring that into your personal statement is going to be critical. Now, once you do all of that, do you think you should apply to less programs or more programs? Uh, you know, I, I could kind of hear you all uh, thinking, at least I'm hoping that you all say to more programs because you're not going to get more interviews by applying to less programs. You should be applying to more programs. And so what if they say no or if they don't reply back? Well, that's the best way to find out whether they are, you finally you've applied to a program that is going to make an exception or not. And every year there is countless number of examples where programs make an exception. They don't even stick with their criteria. So how do you budget for that? Well, um, you know, one less night of eating out times, let's say, 100 nights, that's maybe $2,500. Um, and that could pay for about 100, 150 programs. So look at it in that fashion. And if you have a support system that has supported you through multiple ERAS applications, they don't just don't believe that you can do this or you have the skills to do it. I think it's really important to, to tell them what you're doing different. And certainly if you join us, then, then that's going to be probably the most important step of your life. But budgeting for applying to programs simultaneously as you budget for getting your application put together is critical. The higher the number of red flags, unfortunately, the more expensive it gets because the more programs you have to apply to. And you got to pick your specialty correctly. And I typically do not recommend that you apply to multiple specialties. Next set of questions, U.S. clinical experiences, which externship should you apply to? How many months of clinical observership is ideal? Should I go with the clinical rotations offered by professor or attendings of residency programs if there are any? And how to find compatible programs for me, for example, IMG friendly. 
Next set of questions, residency application. Tell me about SF match and its timeline strategies. How important is application submission timing? How much lower do chances decrease the later you submit? Does it affect your chances if you use letters of recommendation from certain specialty to apply for others? For example, a letter of recommendation from family used for neuro. And then prepping for re-entry participants, especially long-time graduate. And then personal statements. These are all, all, all really, really good questions. So we have this, you know, we have this five, four, three, two, one pass rule. So what, what is this? So this is our tip number six. You need five months of U.S. clinical experience before September. That's the, the time that you apply to, to programs. You need four U.S. letters of recommendation before September. You need three months every other month of audition between September and March. This is in addition to the five months of U.S. clinical experience before September. This should be before you certify your U.S. application. You need to spend two months, preferably uh, kind of the first month disseminated throughout, you know, from now until September and then the second month really dedicated in the month of September on your MSPE, ERAS, personal statements, supplemental ERAS and letter of recommendation revisions. Really important that you do this. Do not leave these things all the way at the end. When you finish a clinical block, you need to walk away with a letter of recommendation in hand. And how do you do that? You know, we have some really good articles on that on our AC Medical Residency Prep Academy uh, page, you know, but, but it's really important that you walk away with a letter in hand before you walk away from a rotation. And you got to kind of plan it out. You can't force the physician to do it, but your performance and how you do and what kind of questions you ask about, you know, your ACGME core competency as it relates to your clinical rotation and, and what they think areas that you should be improving upon. Those are all important. You want to pick one specialty, then you want to apply to as many programs as you can afford. And you know, don't pick two specialties and then apply to half and a half. If you're going to pick two specialties, you better have done all of the above, right? On five, four, three, and two, all of those now get split. So you're splitting your commitment. You're splitting your application. You're diluting your application. So you've got to pick one specialty and you've got to move forward with it. And you've got to make sure your application is very strong. When you got five, four, three, and two done, pick that one specialty and apply to as many programs as you can afford. However, you should not do it without doing 5432, and you should not do it without passing step one and CK. On your first attempt, score is much, much, much less relevant, and all these things need to be done by September. You do this, and you have proper mentorship, you've addressed almost, almost every blind spot in your application with proper mentorship. All the AC Medical members, please avoid the June to September bottleneck for letters of recommendation to U.S. clinical availability, just go ahead and book now. Every year we get physicians that just get burned out by the number of requests that they get. There was one hospital system, I'll never forget it. They got over 600 requests for letters of recommendation. And the person in charge of uploading these letters of recommendation quit, quit two days before applications were supposed to be submitted. It was devastating. It was devastating. So. A lot of things can happen. Just prepare ahead of time so you don't have to deal with these things. Tip number seven, you know, I'm going to dive into this preferred specialty just a little bit more. Apply not just to your preferred specialty, but your only specialty. And there is a few exceptions. You want to join. How do I show that I'm committed to a specialty? Commitment to specialty is important in every specialty, particularly family, particularly pediatrics, particularly all the core specialties. You want to join medical societies for that specialties. You want to join subcommittees within those medical societies and become active. You could be active online, but preferably in person would be good. You want to also minimize referencing other specialties. That's the reason why I don't like you doing multiple specialties once you graduate. If you're a student, that's a different story. But if you've graduated, you don't have the luxury of, of just still trying to figure out what is my preferred specialty? You should have figured it out, at least from, you know, because your competition are U.S. seniors, and the expectation is a fourth-year medical student knows what specialty they want to be. You should, too, as a medical graduate at this point. And some of the exceptions to, to applying to only one specialties. Of course, advanced specialties require a PGY-1 and sometimes a PGY-2 prelim or transitional. What are advanced specialties? These are specialties that you apply simultaneously this coming match cycle, let's say 2023, you apply to, let's say, a child neurology advanced, and you also apply to prelim and transitional. 
And depending on how many years a child neurology needs, they, you know, they, they also require two years. And so you may want to do pediatric prelim, which is typically two years, but you rank both and you're kind of going through double match. And when you have a prelim and, you know, they will ask, well, what is your preferred specialty or what is your advanced specialty? You have to mention that. So that's one of the exceptions. The other exception is, let's say that you've had multiple attempts and let's say that you have the time right now to plan on just hedging your bets and increasing the odds of being offered interviews. We've seen for people with multiple USMLE attempts, we've seen some years where family medicine comes through for them. We've seen some years where internal medicine comes through and they get more interviews from one versus the other. And I just, I always reflect back on what I was telling them. And then I always kind of give in at the end and I say, okay, well, you have multiple attempts, fine. Let's go ahead and do, go with two specialties, let's say family and I am. And for everyone, depending on their history and you know, your, 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 your likes and dislikes, that recommendation can change. But, you know, then I look back and I say, wow, you got four interviews from family and you got none from internal. I'm really happy that we applied to two specialties or vice versa. If my recommendation was for the other specialty. So that's one of the exceptions, but again, that's why I want to speak with you, know a lot more about your background and, and financial situation and, and then make my recommendations accordingly. So um, all the AC medical members, Make sure that you work with your mentors uh, to not just identify your preferred and only specialty, but one that is suitable to your red flags. You may love OBGYN, but you know, if you've had, if it took you, you know, 18 years to graduate from medical school and you've had multiple USMLE attempts, that is not the specialty for you, at least right now as a PGY1 entry. So don't make it so hard for yourself that, you know, you turn back around and say, look, I told you I wouldn't get in. You got to make sure that you give yourself a fair chance, be fair to yourself, be kind to yourself, and don't make it so challenging that you just won't even have a chance. So your only specialty may be different than the specialty you originally thought you were going to end up being. Tip number eight, this is for our international medical students and graduates. So for our U.S. medical students and graduates that are here, just bear with us a little bit. Thank you for your patience. So if you're applying for certification now, of course, there's a lot of requirements, but one of the key items that really stuck out and we're getting very, very close to it is this, you know, 2024 accreditation. So if you're applying for ECF certification now, your school must be listed in World Directory of Medical Schools. Beginning in 2024, your medical school must be accredited by an accrediting agency recognized by the World Federation of Medical Education at the time of your application for ECF certification. You'd be shocked. Like, for example, the country of Turkey, there are medical schools there, brand new, fantastic medical schools that are not recognized by the accrediting body in the country of Turkey. And so people are considering transferring from that school to maybe a Caribbean medical school that is recognized by the Caribbean CAMHP, which is the accrediting body in the Caribbean because they want to come to the United States. So knowing when you're going to be applying to ECFMG certification is critical. So keep these things in mind. Another policy, you got to pass your USMLEs in seven years. Once you pass an exam, you will have seven years to pass the other exams required for ECFMG certification, which excludes step three. There are some exceptions that they may be willing to make ECFMG, but again, they were very, they're not lenient on this. Transfer credits. I would say that, you know, probably 10% of AC medical members have had transfers. They transfer from one medical school to the next. We have some with a with total of three medical schools. I can think of a, a handful of AC medical members that have gone to four medical schools. Now, transfer, this was pretty interesting that, that we got out of the ECFMG catalog, may only be transferred from one medical school to the medical school which awards the final degree. You may request an exception. This tells me that potentially ECFMG is putting a limit on how many medical schools one could have transferred in between in order to qualify for ECFMG certification. So you want to contact ECFMG and get clarification on this based on your particular situation if you've gone to more than two medical schools. This does exclude transfers into pre-med portion of a medical school. And if you've, if ECFMG has recognized your medical education, even if you've gone to four different medical schools, five medical schools, and it was approved by ECFMG before August 27, 2019, that that is going to remain in full effect and that is not going to change. And so those individuals are also excluded. Next set of questions. Should I take USMLE step three? 
How to work around the low step two CK score? Can step three help cover that? I love that question. Next set of questions. Is it beneficial to do research? How important is research experience and publication of program directors? Great question because it's not how important is research to you or I, it's to program directors and that's what matters. And references to research opportunities, how effective is it to be working as a research volunteer in USA during match season session for non-USIMG when applying for internal medicine? And the other question is your graduation 2018, 244, 248, 240, uh, step one, two, and three, continuously working in the internal medicine department home country, a three months UBS clinical experience with strong four letters of recommendation enough to match an IM. <laughs> I gotta be very careful answering this third question. If someone does research or another degree after graduating, does that at times still count as gap towards your graduation? Yeah. So is it beneficial to do research? And here's our tip. Avoid generalizing. I know that we just talked about step one, pass or fail uh, on your application, but let, let me address research here because you know, clearly there's a lot of questions that, that, that comes from this. To, to simply put it for you, do not waste your time on research if you have not addressed other clinical factors that program directors are going to be looking for in your application. And in turn, you decided to focus on research. Most people that do research is either because they need it for J-1 visa sponsorship. They are a U.S. graduate who just graduated and they, they have great U.S. clinical experiences and they just want to get into, let's say, radiology and, and they're doing the one-year research audition with that radiology program. And to them, that they kind of may get away with something like that. And other people that do research is they, they believe that if they're in a big name institution, somehow when shoulders rub, you know, they're going to be able to get into residency. And again, some do, majority don't. So I know that research is not effective utilization of your time. For example, if, you, if it takes you six months, a year in a research facility, they're not going to allow you to do clinical experiences outside of their facility. And and most of them, if you're doing clinical experience with them, they're not going to admit to it because their professional liability insurance is not going to cover it. So that six months could be spent at six different clinical sites, which could not only yield up to six letters of recommendation, but also that six very, very specific touch points with potential decision makers. So I would much rather see you in auditions, in postgraduate sub-internships, in sub-internships, you know, directly in front of decision makers. And even if it's not in front of decision makers, be in clinical sites that resemble uh, what's going to be expected of you in, in, in residency and focus on building the content for your application. You know, and then finally, if you don't believe any other things that I'm saying about research, I want you to open a program director survey by NRMP. And I want you to look at the mean, the popularity and the importance of research across all factors and then drill it down by, by specific specialties. And the same thing for step three. And you'll be shocked to see, like, for example, for family medicine, the popularity is just a little over 10% of the program directors that look for it. And the importance that they gave it was lower than other life experiences in, in, in your life. So I don't recommend that you waste your time on research if you're applying to PGY-1 and any of the core specialties. And if you have not addressed all the other more important factors. So let's go ahead and talk about step one, pass, fail on your application. And I think a lot of people are, are, well, not a lot, but I think we're very prone to generalizing that, hey, listen, step one was my only way to show how good of a candidate I am. And, you know, back then, yes, that's what program directors were doing. They looked at scores and they brought you in, not because they thought you're going to be a good candidate. But that was the only way they were going to go ahead and get through 5,000 applications, right? So now that that's gone, you know, don't look at it as if, you know, oh my God, how is it going to impact me? Well, for every one of you, this is going to impact you differently. Let's say that you passed step one, but you've had, you know, four or five attempts. Passing on the first attempt has always been, even before step one pass fail, passing on the first attempt for all US assemblies has always been more important than the score that you secured on the second or third attempt. So what programs are going to do, they're going to start shifting to other factors. Passing on first attempt, of course, is going to become more important. CK score. There's a there's there's some good publication in PubMed that gives us an indication that CK scores are going to be looked at more closely now, unfortunately. But again, CK is probably on its way out the score as well. We just don't know exactly when it's going to happen. 
you know, in the next six months or in the next two or three years, not sure. Letters of recommendation are going to become more important. However, programs are become, going to become more critical of it. Internal medicine, you know, for example, the uh, Society for Internal Medicine, uh, Society for General Internal Medicine, SGIM, and, and the Program Director Society for all the internal medicine, and they are starting to move towards a standardized letter of recommendation format, very similar to what emergency medicine has been doing for years. It's not implemented yet, but the value of letters of recommendation is going to increase, but not just for you having letters, but the content of the letter and how it's put together and how closely can the selection committee look at the content of that letter and say, okay, because of this and because of these content, that's the reason why this is going to, this person is going to be a good fit. Plus your supplemental ERAS, if you signaled them, if you have a preference for the region, you know, how you handle different life experiences, all those will come into play. MSPE, if it's done well, absolutely. If you're an AC medical member, you can submit your letters of recommendation for analysis. We'll do it live together. Letters of recommendation, MSPE, personal statement, your supplemental ERAS. We want to, we want to have, you know, we want to have eyes on every aspect of your application. We want you to have eyes on every aspect of your application. Personal statement is going to become even more critical. I know of family medicine selection committee members that the only thing they will look at is they will start out by personal statement. They won't even look at the ERAS application. They'll just open up the personal statement, read it. Then they'll go right into letters of recommendation. They'll want to look for at least two or three family physicians that are recommending. And if they like those, then they'll go ahead and open up the ERAS section of your application. So audition rotations, you know, I, I, you know, I'm, over the years, I've even become more of a fan of audition rotations because especially if you have multiple red flags, because we don't disclose and this is really, really bad, which, which we probably wouldn't admit that person into AC Medical, but we don't tell the program director or decision maker that we're about to put you in front to audition that, hey, listen, before you know this person shows up, they've had four attempts on step one and they've had two attempts on step two. We don't do that, right? We want you to get in there and we want you to show your clinical skills and all your ACGME competencies and let them fall in love with you and then they can look at your ERS application. I think that's the best way to handle this, you know, and, and you just, when you do this though, you got to be very careful in how much you disclose during the rotation, because there could be some residents that are pretty interested in, you know, they start asking you questions. And so that's where your membership matters because, you know, we'll go through these scenarios a lot. And uh, sometimes you even need to do individual, like, you know, interview boot camps to kind of walk you through different scenarios as, as what could be asked by, by residents of you and, and based on your red flags. Supplemental ERAS is going to become even more important as you see, you know, four times more number of specialties are now going to be accepting supplemental ERAS and they're going to be wanting to see it. And finally, step three, uh, there was a question that was asked is, you know, will step three score become more important? I doubt it. I highly doubt it because your formidable competitor, which are U.S. medical seniors, they will not sit for step three in order to get into residency. They're just not going to do it. Now, IMGs, with multiple attempts, yes, you kind of got no choice. Even U.S. medical graduates with multiple attempts, you have no choice but to think about step three. But again, I'm really concerned about you sitting for step three. If you've had a history of, of, of failures, I don't want you to fail step three. And research, you know how I feel about it. That's not where you should be putting your focus on. Almost towards the end of the last set of questions and last set of our tips, networking. Any tips on effective networking? How to make connections within the United States? How do we network when we're in different country and nobody is uh, answering our emails? Well, you know, networking, you really got to look at it, not just, well, you know, let me just go ahead and find someone that's going to do me favors. Uh, you got you to gotta give the ammunition to these individuals that you're about to network with and make them understand that they're not wasting their time with you. I repeat, you only get one chance at networking. If your application is not prepared, if you've not addressed your red flags, you know, true red flags, and if you don't have great supporting documents in your ERS application, do not ask a program director or an associate PD or a family member to, you know, stand up for you and ask one of their family and friends in GME to get you an interview, because that's the best way to destroy that opportunity if you do it too fast. Build content for your ERS application show clinical and community activities, especially during COVID, build your commitment to that specialty, and you start to build a type of medical brand that individuals who are going to stand behind you and you're asking to, 
to do you favors are going to be proud of and you're making them look good by having them introduce you to the decision makers that they know. You got to show community and clinical activity during COVID. You need to join medical societies, which I've described, but these medical societies have to be specific to the specialty that you're applying to. And you have to have residency relevant patient contact in US clinical experiences because that's where the decision makers are. I don't care whether it's outpatient or inpatient. I don't want you to go to put all your eggs in one basket and be with one person for six months. I think that your best chance is by number one, applying to programs wide with the strongest application that you can. Then plan B is to do your auditions and just to make sure that, you know, in case you don't get enough interviews because the, the red flags are just overwhelming, at least you're doing these auditions and hopefully something will come of that. And then you want to include all of this in your ERAS and in your personal statement. And then you want to bake that into your interviews, right? And so that's how you, that's best utilization of networking. Now, how do you network once you do all of this? The best way is through these clinical experiences. Other ways that I've heard that people network, which I'm not sure how effective it is. Uh, for example, I get LinkedIn requests all day long and, you know, they're not really networking with me, right? Because I don't, I barely even communicate with, with, with any of, of the people on that network. So, you know, be, be true to yourself. And if you're going to network, make sure that you're utilizing your time effectively. So some say, but some are really good at, at LinkedIn or, or other types of networking. Some are really good at finding a mentor and starting projects with them. And, you know, but if you don't have those type of skills and if you're not here and you haven't gone to school here and you don't understand the culture of the United States and how to kind of navigate your way through all of that, then you have no choice but to do it through these clinical experiences and, and just sequentially increase the, 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 the difficulty of these clinical experiences and, and get closer and closer to decision makers. And then finally, tip number 11, this is the capstone for, for all of our tips. You've got to understand how to use ACG and core competencies to your advantage now and in the future. ACG and core competencies is how US medical seniors are evaluated after every clinical rotation. ACG and core competencies is highly recommended by the Association of American Medical Colleges to include in your medical school uh, student performance evaluation. ACG and core competencies are what permits a resident to go from rotation one to rotation two to rotation three to rotation four. And ACGME core competencies is what gets a resident in trouble on probation and dismissed. So your best bet is to understand how you're going to be evaluated. And so no ACGME core competencies. You can go to acmedical.org forward slash ACGME core. You've got to develop these during your clinical rotations. You've got to include these and, and actively work with the writer to include these in their letters of recommendation. You've got to have the dean of your medical school talk about these in your MSPE. I heard the other day that in an interview, they asked the interviewee, and this is in our podcast, which one of the core competencies do you believe that you're going to be either the strongest in or you're going to have the most challenges with out of the blue. And so thank goodness, you know, him and I we were drilling this in every one of the conversations that we had. And then all of this becomes paramount in your residency preparation. Again, go to acmedical.org forward slash ACGME core. And there's, you know, great deal of discussion and how this gets incorporated into letters of recommendation and, and, and all of that. So that was our webinar. I did want to include this, this slide here. You know, we thought about this leadership development internship at AC Medical for, for many years. And then we finally launched it last year. And uh, Dr. Rosas is, is one of our interns here. And uh, we've, we've really developed this program a lot. And, you know, I, I, I especially recommend that you take a look at uh, acmedical.org forward slash internships and take a look at it and see if this is something that you would benefit from. And of course, if you have any questions, please uh, go ahead and raise your hand. And I hope Dr. Rosas is going to be okay with me volunteering her for answering any questions, but, you know, certainly I can answer it. Um, and I hope Dr. Rosas can as well. Uh, so take a look at this because this can give some incredible content, you know, to your application. As a matter of fact, we're already starting to see the successes of this program. One of our 
intern said was just accepted into a U.S. medical school and she's a, a medical graduate. So, and this was a, you know, this was certainly a, a, a big part of, of her recent past and, and this was included in her interview. So consider it, take a look at it. Of course, this is a residency bridge employment and there's some qualifications and criteria here, but take a look at it and, uh, and let us know. We are accepting applications right now and we're going to accept it uh, right till uh, the, the deadline is there, but I believe it's going to be till early June. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, now we're going to go ahead and open it up to live uh, audience question and answers. So feel free to uh, go ahead and raise your hand, and uh, and we'll go ahead and, and answer your questions. Uh, we have Dr. Sahiti Kota had her hand up. Go ahead and mute yourself. Hi, Dr. Kota. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. How are you, Dr. Mizani? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. Um, so I had a quick question about... Um, so, you know, if my application is not as strong as I want it to be, I don't have enough things in my CV this year, I'm, I'm going to be finishing my step two next month, which doesn't give me a, a lot of time to do like more clinical experience and all of that. So do you suggest going ahead and applying this year for this match and kind of just, you know, see how my chances work out? Or do you suggest that I strengthen my application, um, you know, join AC Medical, do all of you know, whatever you suggest for me and then applying directly next year. Great question. Well, let me ask you this. So you've already graduated from medical school? Um, I'm going to be getting my degree right after my step two CK is done. I just have to go pick up my degree from my school. Got it. And when, when is that going to be? That's in uh, June. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, you should definitely participate in this match now. I'm not sure if I'm going to recommend you applying to all the programs on September 29th, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. I may have you prepare for SOAP. Okay. And um, I'm telling you, anybody that underestimates SOAP is making the greatest mistake of their life. I match through Scramble. Uh, some of these stories of our, of our members that matched in SOAP, it just blows my mind. And so I may do that. I may kind of help you prepare for SOAP. It's a lot less expensive. You're kind of preparing for 2024 match anyways in case SOAP doesn't work. And plus, if you don't match through SOAP, we will fully sponsor your membership for 2024 match. So which, you know, which could be, um, you know, up to $2,200 in saving, but we'll, that's our, that's our uh, match guarantee within our memberships. So that's, that would be my recommendation. But of course, I'll, I'll know a lot more and be able to answer that better. If, and if you come, you can take advantage of one of our free office hour access passes and go to try us for free. Dr. Rosas, can you bring that slide up for try us for free, please? Right there. Yeah. So you can just go right there and, you know, you can, you know, you just fill out a quick application and we'll give you an access pass to one of our office hours. You'll come in and we'll go through a little bit more detail about your background and then I can, you know, I can provide a little bit better uh, information there. Okay, thank you so much. A pleasure, but but I do not recommend that you waste a year. I think that the opportunity is there, take advantage of it uh, 100%. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. All right, we also have Dr. Maha Ignas in the chat. She, I could go ahead and read the question here. It says, uh, how to address year of graduation as a red flag? Well, I, I don't, I mean, you, you don't necessarily just directly address your graduation as a red flag. It's only, um, you know, it's only a red flag if, you know, that you have nothing else to, you know, other like to stand on. And, and I hope that that's not the case. So the way that, that your graduation kind of gets addressed is by, you know, it's by how the application is put together. And, you know, if your application is really put together well, and it just feels fresh and feels competitive to the rest of the and the majority of the applicants were U.S. seniors, then you don't need to come out and say, you know, I'm so sorry that I graduated 10 years ago. You don't need to do that. Your application is going to be able to, you know, your great letters of recommendation, an MSB and a personal statement and a committed application to one specialty, all that is going to, you know, speak for itself. So I don't think that just your graduation situation itself is, is something that needs to be addressed. There's nothing you could do and say that will defend that, right? There's nothing that we can do to defend you know, me graduating 15 years ago, and again, I'm not sure exactly what your situation is, but it happened, right? And and what happened from there to right now, it did. And, you know, I, I, I learned a lot from it, but this is what I've done to, to get ready for my PGY1, you know, and I, and I don't regret any of it. So every per person's circumstances are different. Some do it 
because of health reasons. Uh, one of our members that matched this year, a kidney transplant twice. And, um, you know, he tried in a couple of years and he finally matched this year. Right. And of course that, that was a problem, right? He, it caused a huge gap in, in during medical school and, and post-graduation, but you know, it's, 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 it's all circumstantial. Um, so hopefully that answers a little bit of your question. Yes, go ahead, please. Um, unmute yourself. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Tarasu. Hello, Dr. Mizani and every other body in this meeting. Thank you so much for your very informative talk. Dr. Mizani, just I have a quick question about uh, your graduation. As uh, you mentioned, from what I understood from your talk is uh, that for those people who have been graduated uh, many years ago, like me, and have been in practicing in a specific field of medicine, it's not a good idea to turn to another uh, specialty when they participate in match. Just uh, I wanted to make sure that uh, I understood you in correct way. Thank you. My pleasure. Yes, and I'm I'm a little bit familiar with with your uh, with your background and history, and you know there's there's a lot that comes with a year of graduation and and you know long term practice in um, in a in a in a select specialty, and we take that into consideration. And it's really important the perception that your application gives when it's first looked at in the first thirty seconds. It's really really important. You know the perception that your ERS application, your personal statement gives, including LinkedIn profiles and and uh, you know social media presence and and all of that. Um, if you take a look at our, I think it was uh, two, three or four podcasts ago, uh, one of our members that matched into uh, pathology and what she had to do to to recreate herself on social media. I know that's not your question, but but that's the level of, of depth that you have to look at this. So in your particular situation, with the expertise that you have and how many years you practice there, if you do a really good job on your application, you're going to come across as somebody who is very dedicated to medicine and to your specialty, but not so much that you're that you 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 are not excited about going through this entire process over again and learning and being open to all that residency and that same specialty has to offer here in the United States. And we can see and hear and read that tone, that underlying tone in, in things as simple as the title that is used, that you use for the position that you had, that you mentioned in the US application. So we're gonna be very careful in how we present you so that your, uh, so your application doesn't, you know, that, that, that we can benefit from the time that you've been away from medical school and you've been practicing, but at the same time, you haven't become so battle hardened that, that you're not teachable anymore. And so that's how I would deal with your application. So uh, coming across as very humble and, and down to earth is, uh, is, gonna be, um, is gonna be key, I believe, in your particular situation. Thank you, I got your point. Thank you. Great questions, everyone. We probably have time for one more question and, uh, and then we'll have to adjourn. Yes, uh, Dr. Lady, you have your hand raised. Please unmute yourself. Uh, hello, good afternoon, Dr. Mizani. Good afternoon, nice to meet uh, you. Nice to meet you. Okay, so my question is a little bit similar to the question Dr. Koda had. Uh, I feel like a, I want to apply this year, but I feel like I have no time. <laughs> I work part time. Uh, I'm preparing my step two, hoping like taken probably in August. Um, but it's still, you know, all this, I'm, I'm, I'm like pretty naive in with all this information, with the errors, with the like, all, all, all the stuff. So I really don't know if I'm going to be able to apply this year or I rather like continue preparing like my application and just apply next year. Uh, so let me understand this, um, your situation a little bit, you know, better. So you work part time, correct? Correct. Yeah. And you're studying for your CK? Correct. Okay. And why do you believe that you don't have the time to, you know, like the next four and a half months, you won't have the time to um, get your application prepared for this match cycle? Well, first, because 
I also, um, I'm going to do two rotations, like two months rotations with you guys. Uh, and that's going to be full time. So probably it's going to be like two months that I'm not going to be able to study very well for the step two. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, so that's going to, yeah, so probably that's one. When are your rotations scheduled? Uh, one is in May and the other one is going to be in July. Okay. And when are you taking CK? Uh, I haven't scheduled yet, but hopefully August. Okay. Maybe September. Yeah, depending. I think what you could do is if you can get yourself to three months of clinicals, and maybe the third one could be live online. And okay. usually live onlines are a little bit, little bit less demanding. Some live onlines are pretty brutal, but what specialty are you applying to? I want to apply to internal medicine. Perfect. Um, we have some internists. They're fantastic. They really run their internal medicine live online professionally, and they are very understanding of, of other things that you got to do. So that's probably what I would do. And you know, you can you can plan your step two CK around that live online. And it also, I'm not sure when was the last time you sat for any of these US MLEs, but you know, it's, if, it, if I had to sit down and go through, <laughs> you know, step two CK, I'm going to, it's a, it's a, it's a change of, you know, frame of mind. And, and, and I really got to, it takes a lot. So maybe being in a clinical setting is going to kind of help that process a little bit along. Uh, but you do have to have probably 30 days of just solid time where you're doing five, 600 questions a day and timing yourself and, you know, all the, the, the things that we do for step two CK preparation. If you get yourself to to three letters of recommendation and, and three months of recent experience, I don't think that you're actually disadvantaging yourself by doing that over the next four and a half, five months. Even if you do not get the third letter of recommendation by September 29th, which I don't think is going to happen because uh, most of the physicians that we work with are, are pretty understanding. And sometimes they will even accept and they would want <laughs> me to draft the letter of recommendation on their behalf for you. And, you know, if that happens to be the case, we actually have a service for that. And what happens is you just, you, you can sign up for that. And usually you get the letter pretty much the next day or two. And most of the problems with, with physicians, it's not that they don't want to recommend. They just, it takes five to 10 hours to draft a good letter. And so if you take that out of the equation and then you don't burden yourself with having to travel everywhere with in-person clinicals and you got your live online, let's say that you do five to 10 hours a week, or maybe, you know, 10 to 15 hours, the rest of the time you can focus on CK studies. Bam. Uh, you know, you got, you, you just, you just didn't lose the opportunity on an entire, losing an entire year. So I think you should do that. And then as you're doing that, we will also work with you to make sure that you also prepare for SOAP uh, and, and we'll figure out all of those before you certify your application as if you're not going to match. So that's the best way to, to, to optimize the next five months in your favor. But I certainly would not tell you to just sit out and, and, and let this match go by. Okay. Can I ask you just a, another question? Uh, from my work, I work in ophthalmology as an ophthalmology technician. I did that because um, I live in New York. And in order to survive in this city, I have to like get a better like job, like, um, you know, the, the payment was low in internal medicine, but I'm not sure if the letter of recommendation of my boss is going to work for internal medicine. Great question. How long have you been in the, in this ophthalmology clinic? Probably three years. Oof. Yeah. And do you, uh, do you work with any, um, is this optom optometry or ophthalmology? Ophthalmology. Okay. So I'm assuming that there are some, oh, and I'm assuming that there's some internists that probably refer patients out to this yes, ophthalmologist? Yes, Allah. Yeah. Okay. Have you ever had an opportunity to directly interact with these referring physicians? Uh, no, yet, no. I would start to work on that. Okay. And what I mean by that is on the patients that they're referring to you, not exactly sure exactly how we're going to do it right now, but that seems like a viable thing to do because a letter from an ophthalmologist 
it's probably not going to make a big difference in, in your internal medicine. How, unless, unless the ophthalmologist drafts that letter, knowing about the, the internal medicine milestones and what to talk about in that letter as a result of you being employed there. That's a pretty challenging letter to write. I wouldn't expect him or her to know how to draft that or want to draft that. But that would be my approach to the two or three years of being in an ophthalmology uh, clinic. And um, so that's generally, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. My pleasure. Of course, I can't say no. Dr. Uh, Aria, you have your hand raised. Go ahead, please. Unmute yourself. Um, hi, thank you, Dr. Mazani, and um, um, one here. I have two questions. Uh, number one, um, I'm um, aiming at doing two months rotation uh, in uh, internal medicine. How do I choose? Um, I, I like we talked about before. Really, there is a lot of inpatient, outpatient, etc. How do I really just choose out one rotation? And I'm like, okay, let me do this. A uh, one, a uh, one or six uh, weeks, and then. Uh, one month or six weeks, and then I move on to the next. How do I make that decision easier? And then number two, the second question is, uh, uh, you talked about the importance of leaving a rotation with a level of recommendation. I'm very new to this, like um, uh, Dr. Lady was also putting out, um, but I've, I've had some information that actually the recommenders uh, uh, put the letters of recommendation directly, I think, into the application system. So how do I make my uh, referee remember me when they are doing the, um, probably they're uploading the list of recommendation? Great questions. Um, I'm happy you asked those. Uh, okay. How do you pick two clinical blocks? Budget is important. I think availability is important. And the specialty you're, you're looking at, are you looking at internal medicine or another specialty? I'm only looking at internal medicine. Okay. And when was your last clinical experience? Like meaningful clinical experience, like, you know, like a, like a medical student does. Um, I graduated in 2019. I'm working in a clinical setting. I've never had any U.S. clinical experience. I'm a non-U.S. IMG. Okay. okay. So I would, I would prefer that you start out with a, you know, pretty nice and gentle internist before you go and um, go in front of a program director. Uh, so I would probably pick, you know, based on where I have family and friends, uh, I would want to do it in person if you can. Uh, and are you able to do it in person or does it have to be uh, a telerotation? I'm able to do it in person. Okay, great. So I would start out with somewhere where I have family and friends where I could stay with them. That would save me a lot of money on, on, on room and board. And then I would do my internal medicine there. I would heavily rely on what our enrollment consultants tell you. I would heavily rely on what, what past members have reviewed and given feedback, take a look at those. And I would pick a PGY1 Connect clinical site uh, that has a pretty high percentage of our members reporting that they've secured letters of recommendation from that attending. So that's how I would start it. And I would, Focus on internal medicine, not necessarily any of the subspecialties. I would just do internal medicine, bread and butter. And I wouldn't worry too much about inpatient, uh, but there are some that, you know, you get inpatient, you get outpatient, and it's a really nice, well-balanced, you know, so, so just discuss those with our enrollment consultants when you speak with them. So that's how I would pick my first month. My second month, I would still pick general internal medicine, and I would use the same criteria. And... Um, and I would want to be with someone still, I wouldn't want to be with a program director just yet because I would probably want to do that with the program director. I probably want to do that, you know, as my third or fourth rotation. Um, but if you're only doing two rotations then maybe you feel pretty confident after, you know, one rotation and you want to get right there in front of the decision makers and, and, and so be it. And I'm not sure about the rest of your application and, and what red flags we're dealing with. So that's, that's the, uh, that's, that's how we pick the rotations. And it, could you just tell me about the second uh, question that you had, the second part? I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't write it down. I should have written it down. Uh, for my second question, uh, you um, clearly um, stated out um, how it is important to leave um, a clinical rotation oh, with a little yeah. recommendation. Gotcha. In, my yes. in my thinking, I was thinking this is in hard copy. 
Uh, but um, um, I've gotten some information before that during the. Yes, yes, yes. Let me let me share this with you all. So uh, everyone, uh, there's a couple of pages I want you uh, uh, all to see. Yes. So I want you to go to acmedical.org forward slash LOR. And, and again, I know that people are going to tell you to waive your right. Do not give in to that. And if and don't worry about insulting the physician or anything like that. And this is uh, the page on should I waive my right to see my letters of recommendation or not. We go through um, several points before we uh, we make a recommendation. So take a look at that. And there's also requesting and securing letters of recommendation. There's this page. And here there are six steps. And step six talks about how do you walk away with a letter of recommendation in hand. And so take a look at these. And this is going to help you plan out your four weeks, week one, week two, week three, week four, as it pertains to walking away with a personalized letter of recommendation. So um, I hope that these answer your, your question. Dr. Diego, thank you for having your hand raised. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, Dr. Rumi Sami. Hi, nice to see you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Misani, I have uh, about the step three, you know, because usually you hear the other, you know, for IMGs, you hear like the other, uh, like a point, like they say, like how you have to do it. So I, I'm just confused now. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and I don't blame you. And let me have you make this decision yourself. Let me show you this. Mm -hmm. Uh, by the way, this is, we're going to an outside site. This is an RMP, and uh, certainly you can uh, do this on your own. I'm just taking you here to residency data, and I'm going to take you here to program director survey. What specialty are you applying to? I'm an uh, internal medicine anesthesia. Um, uh, two different specialties. I certainly would not do that, but let's go ahead and just look at, look at internal medicine. Can you read this title up here for us, please? Yeah, education and academic performance characteristics consider in deciding whom to interview. So this is how popular the factor is. This is how important that factor is. Step one, although it was 90.5 popularity, the importance of it was 3.7 MSPE was 85.7 with an importance of 4.2. Here's your step three. I, 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 it's too really low, okay. Not only is the popularity low, but let's go down and take a look at the importance of it, 3.3. .3. So of the 17.5% uh, program director said, sure, I'll look at step one. The popularity, or the importance wasn't really that high. Let's go ahead and take a look at anesthesiology, just for 42 program directors responded to this. And step three, can you read that? I, I, 7.1, 7 yeah. And uh, now what's interesting is to those 7.1, the importance was a 3.5. And just for comparison, step two CK was a 3.7. So if you want to satisfy 7.1%, maybe half of those that really care about step three, I'm, I'm not really sure if that's the best utilization of, of your time. Um, you know, and uh, by the way, if anybody's wondering about research and anesthesiology is actually pretty, you know, it's, it's pretty competitive. Research was at 40.5% with an importance of 3.3. .3. There's a lot more factors above that that you should be focusing on. And if you look at internal medicine, research was 29.4% with an importance of 3.4. Okay. So if I was to ask you, you know, Dr. Diego, mm -hmm. um, I want to study first step three and I want to do some research, knowing this fact right now, what would you tell me if you were my mentor? Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah, step three is not, it's not important. Yeah, absolutely. Research is, yeah, absolutely more, like a true two or three times more. But, but, but still, research is still at, at, you know, 
less than 30% in internal medicine, still not a good utilization of your time. You've got to focus on those factors that are 80, 90, you know, 70, 60, 50. Once you address all of those big factors, then you can kind of work yourself down chronologically in a descending order, then we're, we're, you know, address those other factors. That's how you use this program director survey. Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Great question. All right, everyone. Uh, I certainly uh, appreciate everybody being here. Um, you know, we had a great hour and 44 minutes together. And so the, uh, the recording of this webinar is going to be available in, in about a week. And we really appreciate uh, you all being here. Hopefully this was helpful and you heard a lot of new and fresh information. And, and thank you for everybody's participation. Really looking forward to working with you all. And, uh, and if you're not a member, please you know, consider joining us. You know, we take your, your, your medical career pretty seriously and we've been through it ourselves. And so we, uh, you know, we're, that's, that's, that's where our mentorship is going to come from. Again, thank you. Uh, you all be safe and uh, we'll see you in, in the next webinar. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.